When we're looking at the scale of evolutionary change, it's important to distinguish between two different phenomena known as microevolution and macroevolutions. Microevolution involves changes at the genetic level within a population over a few generations. Another term for this is natural selection. This is an easily observable phenomenon since it occurs in such a short span of time and we can watch it happen. Macroevolution is much more difficult to observe and test. This is the large-scale evolutionary change that happens over longer periods of times. This includes things like the origin of new species and mass extinctions of populations. Basic terms of microevolution. There are a few terms and definitions that are helpful to know and understand. If you remember from our levels of biological organization, a population is a group of individuals of the same species living in a particular area. A population of a herd of elephants around a watering hole. A gene pool consists of all the alleles of all the genes of all the individuals in that particular area. If we're looking for genetic diversity, how could we introduce genetic diversity into a population? One way to do this is through sexual reproduction and mutations. Microevolution. Sexual reproduction can be used to influence genetic variation. Sexual reproduction can reshuffle the alleles that are already present in a population um, through crossing over and independent assortment and then also the combination of, uh, of genetic information in gametes at fertilization. Another way that we can introduce um, new alleles into a population is through the introduction of mutations. Mutations produce new genes and new alleles. A mutation is a permanent change in the nucleotide sequence of DNA and occurs at a very low rate in any set of genes, so their contribution to genetic changes in a large population can be very small. However, in a small isolated population, like life on a secluded island, genetic variation by mutation can have a much larger impact. Some processes that can lead to microevolution. There are several processes that can lead to the accumulation of small changes that ultimately lead to microevolution. Um, these processes are things like genetic drift, gene flow, um, natural selection. Genetic drift is, occurs when allele frequencies within a population change randomly by chance alone. Generally speaking, this will have a negligible effect on a large population. However, small populations it can have a very dramatic effect. In the case of a bottleneck effect, the population experiences a dramatic reduction in population size, and it leads to the exclusion or the inclusion of certain alleles in the remaining population. A change in the gene pool that occurs when a change in the gene pool that occurs when there is a dramatic reduction in size of population. Individuals are killed at random, and alleles alleles in survivors may not be re representative of the original population. The founder effect is very similar, except that instead of a natural disaster wiping out a large portion of the population, we have a small sample of individuals becoming isolated and forming their own population. Here's an example of how the genetic drift has greater effects in small populations. This bowl of jelly beans represents the alleles in a population. Half are blue and half are white. The two colors correspond to the two different alleles of one gene in a population. When a large sample is removed from the bowl, the percentages of blue and white jelly beans are close to those of the original population. If you were to only take two or three jelly beans from the bowl, um, you're much more likely that you're going to have percentages that just deviate from the original population. So if we have a great big population, but we separate off just one or two individuals, we are going to see um, a dramatic change in that allelic population. So gene flow. Gene flow occurs when individuals move into and out of a population and interbreed with the resident population. If these new individuals can, have success, can successfully interbreed with the local population, we will see an introduction of new genetic information. However, we don't have a new species. Genes are flowing into and out of the population, but we're not really creating a new species. It's not until that population is then cut off from the genetic river that those genes become isolated and specified. And as that population becomes more and more specific, it will lose its ability to successfully reproduce with other members of the community. When this happens, we've developed a new species. Species is a population of, or a group of populations whose members are capable of successfully interbreeding under natural conditions to produce fertile offspring. 
A great example of this would be a mule. A mule is a cross between a horse and a donkey. A mule is not actually considered a, its own species because um, a mule is not, mules are infertile. So um, donkeys and horses are separate species. They cannot interbreed to perform um, fertile offspring. Charles Darwin, on the origin of species, proposed that species were not, were not specially created, unchanging forms, but modern species were descendants of ancestral species that ultimately evolution occurs by natural selection. We can summarize the major ideas from his work as the following. Number one, individual variation exists within a species. Some of this variation is inherited. Two, some individuals have more offspring than others because of their particular inherited characteristics makes them better suited to the environment. This is the process of natural selection. And three, evolutionary change occurs as traits of individuals that survive and reproduce become more common in the population. Traits of less successful individuals are going to become less common over time. Natural selection. Natural selection is, um, according to Darwin's ideas, an individual's evolutionary success can be measured by fitness. Fitness, fitness compares the number of reproductively viable offspring among individuals. Individuals who have more successful offspring will have more of their genes represented in future generations. In the case of studying evolutionary fitness, it's important to not only be healthy, but also to have reproductive success. Over the course of many generations, we will find that individuals with higher fitness will experience greater reproductive success and will produce offspring that are also likely to fit, be fit and have a higher chance of reproductive success. Over time, we will find that the survival of certain genes that, have, that, that increase fitness will have a greater contribution to the genetic landscape of a population, whereas those with a lower fitness will be weeded out of the population. And we'll see that landscape of the population change over time. This is known as adaptation. If we were to suddenly see a dramatic change in their environment, we may see a huge change in the population as well. A mutation is a permanent change in a cell's DNA. Such mutations in the sex cells are heritable, meaning they can be passed on to future generations. Mutations are fairly rare. Still, mutation is critical to evolution because it provides the only means for creating new genetic information. A point mutation is a nucleotide sequence error often resulting from incorrect insertion of a single base during DNA replication. Mutations can also be more dramatic. For example, a section of a chromosome may be duplicated, resulting in a longer chromosome containing additional DNA. Likewise, a section of a chromosome may be deleted, resulting in a loss of DNA and an incomplete chromosome. Most mutations that arise do nothing or are harmful to an organism. However, a few mutations occur that are adaptive and contribute new genetic information to a population. Gene flow is the movement of alleles between populations. This movement occurs when individuals from one population migrate into the territory of another population with a different gene pool. Plants called California tarweeds are found throughout California. Although divided into many local groups, the species forms a single population. Gene flow occurs between the groups, so no group has a gene pool separate from the rest. At some time in the past, one or a few of these tarweeds somehow got to the Hawaiian Islands over 3,900 kilometers away, possibly as a seed stuck to a bird's foot or feathers. Once in Hawaii, the plant reproduced and formed a new population. The great distance separating Hawaii and North America prevented most plants or seeds from traveling from one to the other, making gene flow between the populations non-existent. Therefore, the gene pools of the two groups were reproductively isolated and evolution of the mainland tarweeds and the Hawaiian tarweeds proceeded separately. As new mutations arose among the Hawaiian tarweeds, those alleles that helped them to adapt to and survive in their new home were selected for. Eventually, new species of plants found only in Hawaii, including the Hawaiian silver sword, arose from the ancestral population derived from the California tarweeds. Genetic drift is a change in allele frequencies that can occur by chance in a small population. 
Consider a hypothetical population of 10,000 penguins in which one individual in 10 carries a given allele. A natural disaster strikes and the population loses half its members, including 550 individuals who carried the allele. The frequency of the allele in the population thus drops from 10% to 9%, but this is a small effect on allele frequency, and no alleles are lost. Now consider a population of 10 with the same allele frequency of 1 in 10. There is now but a single carrier of the allele. If this population likewise loses half its members and the one member of the population who carried the allele is not a survivor, the frequency of the allele in the population drops from 10% to zero. This allele can now only be replaced by mutation, unlikely, or by migration from another population. This is an example of genetic drift, the chance alteration of allele frequencies in a population, with such alterations having the greatest impact on small populations. Sexual selection occurs when some members of a population mate more often than other members. In practice, this is mating based on phenotype, which is any observable trait in an organism, including differences in appearance and behavior. It is the behavior of strutting and chest swelling in a male sage grouse that causes a succession of female grouse to mate with it rather than nearby competitors. It's easy to see that if one male mates four times as much as the average male of his generation, his alleles stand to increase proportionately in the next generation. Differential mating success among members of one sex in a species often is based on choices made by members of the opposite sex in that species. Some individuals may have traits that give them a better fit to their environment and consequently greater success at survival than other members of their population. The individuals more likely to survive long enough to reproduce are more likely to pass on their traits. Thus, the traits that aid in survival are the ones most likely to be passed on to the next generation. This phenomenon is known as natural selection. Natural selection is the only agent of microevolution that consistently acts to adapt populations of organisms to their environment. Because of this fact, natural selection is generally regarded as the most powerful force in evolution. Sometimes evolution through natural selection can be observed over just a few years. Such an example was provided when a drought occurred in 1977 on Daphne Major, one of the Galapagos Islands. A large part of the island's population of the finch Geospiza fortis died during this drought. In 1978, it was observed that the average beak depth of the finches that survived the drought was greater than the average beak depth that had been measured in a survey conducted before the drought in 1976. Individuals with the larger beaks were better able to crack open the large, tough seeds that were available during the drought. Finches with smaller beaks starved during the drought from lack of an accessible food source. The offspring of the survivors also were observed to have a larger average beak size than the population before the drought. Thus, the population had evolved through natural selection over the course of just a few short years. All right, so macroevolution is going to be the large-scale evolutionary change over long periods of time. Carl Linnaeus developed a Latin binomial scheme for naming organisms. The genus name is followed by the specific epithet. Both are going to be italicized. So, um, for example, human beings are going to be homo sapiens. Linnaeus also developed a system for classifying organisms into a series of increasingly broad categories. Species, genus, family, order, class, phylum, kingdom. Um, the domain was added later as the most broad category. Here is an example of that um, descending level of complexity. Phylogenetic trees are going to be branching diagrams that depict hypotheses about evolutionary relationships among species or groups of species. So this begins by con constructing a character matrix where we are going to, um, based on certain characteristics, produce sort of a branching tree that's going to hypothesize about when these um, organisms last shared a common ancestor. And that's going to be it for this section.